want to thank you all for coming this morning and letting me have this opportunity to be a part of your life. Um, I don't like starting out with an introduction, but you guys mind if I kind of sit down with you and be comfortable? All right. I, I struggle with anxiety, and uh, I'm not a speaker that can stand up on stage behind a lecture, and I don't even like the microphone because it just adds to the, um, yeah, it just adds to the, I, I feel like that stress, stress that I have to be good. And, um, so I, I'm like a conversationalist that, uh, it always takes me like 30 seconds to a minute to, to find myself comfortable with an audience, with, with I get to uh, speak. Thank you. My name is Jeff Dalden. I live in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and I was invited, uh, I was in the area this week, and I was invited to come and, and speak with you, and I was like, oh man, I'd love to. Um, I want to tell you a little bit, I'm nobody different than you. I want you to understand that I'm, I'm a father, I'm an educator, I'm a teacher, I'm a coach, um, I'm a mental health professional, but I, I don't think my talk with you this morning, I don't want to waste your time, but I, I, I don't think it's really about mental health or suicide prevention. I, as much as I think my heart right now is, I want to talk about life. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are in, in your life, what you might be going through. I'll tell you something, everybody has a story. Everybody has a story. Um, you know, people come into your life for one of two reasons. And it doesn't matter if a teacher, a, a therapist, a counselor, a coach, a, a friend. I think people come for one of two reasons. Either to plant seeds or to pick the fruit, get something they need, and they walk away. It's up to you to recognize who these people are. And I'll tell you, self-esteem-wise, in, in all of my work, people have often asked me, Hey, Jeff, what do you think is the most important thing that we need to give young people? And I'll tell you something, I don't hesitate, I say self-esteem. And I will say to you, I'll say to my kids, I'll say to my, my audience, parents, teachers, mental health, I'll say it, it, it listen, I'll tell you, you're smart, you're strong, you're beautiful, you're capable, you can. I'll say it all day long. But what I struggle with is if you don't believe these words yourself, our words don't matter. I hope I get to plant some seeds today. I'm nervous because I don't tell a lot of people what I'm going to share with you. But it's on my website so people know if they want to read it. When I was 16 years old, I was in the hospital. I was in a psychiatric hospital in uh, Merrimack, New Hampshire, Brookfield. And I want to share with you how this happened. I was also in a psychiatric hospital 23 years old when I was in the Marine Corps. So I've been hospitalized twice. And I'm proud of you. When I grew up, I didn't know that my family was dysfunctional. Because I don't think I was aware. You see, you only know what you know. But there's so much more to know if you would just open your heart and have a growth mindset, not a fixed mindset. Many people have a fixed mindset. You don't understand. You don't know what I gotta go through. You, you don't gotta see what I see. But, Everyone has a story, and I want to say this, and I want to be sensitive. You can't have the victim mindset. You can't have that. 
Because if you have the victim mindset, that's a hard place to get out of. You'll always be the victim. But you're not the victim. I, I want you to choose, like I've had to choose, and I've had to choose through asking for help and doing the work. I've had to choose to not be the victim, but to be a victor. I, I am a man that lives with mental illness. I'm diagnosed with major depression, bipolar type 2, and post-traumatic stress disorder. When I was young, I was labeled with ADD and ADHD and ABC and MOPSE. I was labeled with a lot then that it was like, we don't talk about this. We, 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 and as I got older and things started happening in my life, it was like, aha, oh, okay. Now, you know what I've come to really come to realize is that these things that happen in my life, and I blamed it on my parents, and I blamed it on the teachers, the coaches, and this person, and that person, my friends, I've come to realize that it's a long time, maybe I was blaming on the wrong people. Who do you think is the hardest person to get to know? And we're in a place where we're getting the tools to be able to cope and solve some of these issues that we've been dealing with in life. You see, now here's the thing. I know we're here, but the question is a little bit deeper. Are you here? Or are you, I don't need to be here, this is stupid. This, and I think there's these, these phases that we go through. Part of it is anger. I, I don't want to be here. Part of it is you're the victim. I think now if I can plant the seed and, and my heart can speak to yours, open your heart and lose your ego. This isn't bad. This is this is great. Now we're going to get tools, but you have to have that growth mindset. And so when my family moved from New York to New Hampshire, my junior year of high school, I remember specifically. I was an athlete, I had friends, I was popular, and then I go to a new school. Now, I've learned in mental health, this adjustment is, there's a, there's a diagnosis called adjustment disorder. And that's very real. So when I moved to New Hampshire, and I didn't have my friends, we didn't have social media, all of a sudden it was like, I, I just became this person nobody knew. I was depressed, I, I couldn't stop crying, I was angry, I was yelling, I didn't know how to ask for help, I'm just, I was breaking down, I wasn't talking, I was screaming, and if anything I say might trigger someone, it's okay to feel, I, I want to say, thoughts, that's what they are, they have thoughts, like an arm is an arm, leg a leg, feelings, I've come to learn that if we are not comfortable talking about our feelings, then you hold them in, and at some point it manifests, and there comes a point where you have to address them. And so where are we are in the here and the now, this is a great place to learn. And so one night, I took my father's weapon. It was two o'clock in the morning, and I sat there, and I don't think I would pull the trigger, I don't know. And I had a bottle of Tylenol, and somehow my father walked down the stairs. You know, ladies and gentlemen, the only time I've ever seen my father cry was when I looked at my dad that morning and I said, I need help. And so my mom and dad got in the car, and my mom drove, my dad sat in the back, and he was a jeep. He had his arm around me, and he just he cried. You know, my father has never told me he's proud of me. My father has never told me that. I was abused as a child. My parents were both alcoholics. My father didn't even get sober until he was 73 years old. You know who my hero is? My dad. Yet he still never said but I learned that that's okay. 
And I'll tell you why, because like what I said to you a little bit earlier, you only know what you know. And if you only know what you know, you can only do what you have chosen to learn. And so if we have this fixed mindset, we're the victim, we're bitter, we're angry, those people, that people, them, there, that situation, this fixed, I want you, do you know why we forgive people? I learned for me, you don't forgive people for that. You forgive people for yourself. And so I've chosen, as a man who lives with mental illness, I'm not a victim to being a man who lives with mental illness, I'm going to choose to be a victor. So I'm in therapy, I'm on the medication, I have my medication in the car, in my bed, and I'm not allowed to bring it in. Every morning, the first thing I get up, medication was the important thing. And then I wake up and I have a pre-morning routine. Because I don't know about you, but I have anxiety where I'm in like a 7, 8, 9, and, and if I get to a 10, I'm going to like react in a way that I shouldn't. And so I wake up and I, I breathe, I have these affirmations, I visualize, I, I journal, I stretch, I do yoga, I prepare a good breakfast so that I, I want to own my day, I don't want my day to own me. And that's part of learning and therapy, to have tools so that I can respond and not react in situations. And a lot of this came about seven years ago. I went through a divorce after 17 years of being married. Amazing woman. And, and one day, after I divorced, I found myself looking in the mirror. And, and the mirror's never been a favorable place. I think some of you might understand. We look at ourselves, I'm not as smart as other people. I'm, I'm not as, as, as good, I'm not as strong, I'm fat. I, I don't think people are gonna judge me. Self-esteem, when you don't like a reflection that looks back in the mirror, don't blame it on the mirror. <coughs> Spend more time. So when we went through a divorce one day, I looked in the mirror and I said, what did I have to do? What did I have to do with our marriage after 17 years not working? And I realized that it was my mental illness that was greater than I ever expected it to be. And so you, you have, I'll tell you three things I think are important. Your choices, your attitude, and your behavior. It was then I was like, okay, you know what, enough is enough. I'm part of the problem. So what am I going to do? I can either be a victim and things continue to go wrong, or I can choose to continue to ask the therapy and get help and try and understand why I do, why I think. It was the greatest decision I've ever made. And now my wife, my ex-wife and I, we have a great relationship. I am not today who I was then. That's about who. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you something and you're going to judge me. And that's okay because I always said that if I can't be honest with who I get to talk to, I don't want to talk to you. My wife, this is going back seven years at that divorce time. My wife had come home from the hospital after having a full hysterectomy. It's just a, a, a very serious procedure for women. And on the morning that I brought her home, it was about 9 o'clock, I picked her up at the hospital, I, I drive her home, and she was given 30 days of bed rest. The doctor, 30 days bed rest, recover, take care of yourself, no cooking, no cleaning, no exercising, no work, you take care of 30 days. So I bring her home, I bring her up to her room, I, I settle her in, get her what she needs, make sure she's comfortable. And then I walk out on her. I hate myself for that. And I have had to do a lot of work, and I, I'm sorry. But I, and I know I'm not, you're not the 
the ones they need to apologize to, but if you're looking at me in a different way, I start, I'm sorry about that. I've had to apologize to her hundreds of times, and I have, and I've asked for forgiveness, and you know who one of the hardest people is to forgive? Is there anyone here who has never done anything that they wish they didn't do? We've all done things we wish we didn't do. We've all said things we wish we didn't say, right? But yet we look and judge people for the very little that we think we know about them. Nobody knows you. Nobody really knows the depth of what we may have been. Nobody knows the depth of me. I've learned not to look and judge people. Because if I look and judge you, then I keep remembering that, Jeff, you have imperfections. And instead of judging and looking at them, take care of yourself because that's where you need to put your energy. And so my simple goal is to become this. I just someday want to be the man that I aspire to be. I, I've struggled for many times, but, but I want big goals and tasks, and, and I got to this and achieve this, and my ADD and OCD would compartmentalize things, and it would be financial, and then ABC, one, two, three, do this, do this. It would be spirituality, it would be family, it would be my personal goal, vacations, this, 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 how many, how many days. And my therapist said to me, said, Jack, you're driving yourself crazy because if you fail in one area or you don't meet your expectations, that everything else follows suit. I said, oh, that's interesting. She said, how can we simplify it? So you know what my goals are every day today? On the daily? I just want to show up and do the best I can. But Jeff, you're 48 years old, you're a businessman, you've got a family, you've got, your goal's got to be bigger. Is that true? I just want to show up and do the best I can. And then tomorrow, I'm going to show up and do the best I can. Before I open up for questions, let me ask you something. Have you ever been disappointed? No. No? I think we've all had some just sadness and disappointment. Let me, those of you that may have been disappointed, have you ever asked where does disappointment come from? That's right. I need very few people that understand that. And so I, you have these expectations of my family should have done this, or the therapist should do this, or our coaches, our teachers, our parents, our go. We have expectations. I've learned to change my expectations because I realize that when they're not met, I'm disappointed. Now that's on me. I don't know, and I know I can't change people, places, and things. I can choose to change me. So I focus on two things, not the expectation, one, the objective. So they invite me to come here, oh, I'd love to. What time, what day? Uh, Friday, how about nine o'clock? Awesome, did I get a good night's sleep? The objective is I'm gonna go back to did I get a good night's sleep? Did I get up on time? Did I have a good breakfast? Did I do what I need to do to come here? And it's not about the expectation. Do I have a microphone? Is everybody seated forward? They are all the same. Who cares? The objective is, hey, Jeff, uh, our, our audience is ready. Oh, good. Um, hey, everyone, thanks for letting me be a part of your life. I'm going to respect you, and I won't respect you back. But if I respect you and you choose not to respect me back, is that my issue or is that yours? Yeah. You can't change people, places, and things. You choose to, to change yourself and choose a growth mindset and to open your heart. Number two, I've learned to replace expectation with appreciation. Are you, what's your name? Are you listening? Liz, I'm Jeff, nice to meet you. Thank you for letting me be a part of your life. And, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if that sounds silly to you, but someone that lives with mental illness, I've come to learn to just stop. Breathe. Breathe. To be mindful of. Listen. 
just thank you that I get to kind of nice about relationships. I think there's two questions we, we need answered every day. Can I trust you? You're listening because there's a sense of you having trust in me. Number two, do you care about me? You're listening because there's a sense that you know I've been through what we may have been through. I care about us. You know something, when it really breaks down, I think we have more in common with people than we think, but we don't get the chance to open up to them. So number one, the objective. I'm going to show up and I'm going to be prepared. Wake up, get up, dress up, show up. That's half the battle. I'm not that funny. That's half the battle. But yet many of us, I don't know, we can't do that. And then three things, your attitude matters, positive attitude, positive behavior, better choices. That makes sense. But I think we're growing up in a time where our smart devices, our phones, have become a problem. And I don't think it's our fault, necessarily. Because the, the, the young mind matures, I think, 11 to 25, about your middle 20s. Yet we're giving you these devices that we're not mature enough, this prefrontal cortex, this frontal lobe is not mature enough to understand the consequences that come as a result of these devices that affect our emotions to get deep with it. It's called something like the dopamine effect. And so we get on these devices and Instagram and Snapface and, and group text and YouTube and, and I want more, I want more, I want more, I want more. Do you know if we spend one of four or five, I wrote, I wrote a book on it. My TED talk is about this. If you spend more than four or five hours a day in your smartphone, you're 70% more likely to have major depression in your life. I'd say, depending on the person, one to two, three hours. The more we're on this, the more of a negative effect it's having on our mental well being. Because the more we're here, the more we feel alone, we're in isolation. The more alone we feel, the more isolation, the more we start to feel we're disappointed or disappointing or burdening our families, we become sad. You become sad, you start to become depressed. I'm not even talking about clinically, but your anxiety, your stress. There's a diagnosis now that if you're overwhelmed, that's a mental illness. So I want to invite you to take your phone, put it down a little bit. How about just go to sleep with that? Now you get a decent, I think, no, I think we need eight hours of uninterrupted sleep. And if you're ugly, you need more. Now I'm not saying you're ugly, but maybe you have an ugly attitude. Like your sleep is broken up, you're on your phone, your parents say, oh, good morning, and you like shut up forever. <laughs> bad attitude, bad behavior, bad choices. If we can put the phone down and get more involved, whether it be extracurricular activities, whether it be school sports, if it be theater, it could be journaling, it could be exercising. The more involved, the less isolation, the more people, coping skills, problem-solving skills, communication, self-esteem. That's important. number one, sleep. Number two, nutrition. And I'm not even going to medication and, and therapy. I'll tell you, nutrition, I think, can make a big difference. More water, less soda. More protein, less carbs. You know what's the best friends? Sugar and depression. They hang out together. They're homies. Number three, get more involved. I'm leaving a couple books with you. I wrote a book, the title is Boom. One word that is a factor and an effect in your life. I have trouble waking up in the morning. But just like many of you, I'm, I don't want to get up, I don't want to go. I don't want to be here. I, boom, get out. It's a fact. Boom, do it. It's also an effect. Hey, take out the trash. Boom, do it. And then I take out the trash. Boom, I did it. It wasn't that bad. One word, it's a fact and an effect. It became a bestseller within 18 hours. And you know something you can't realize? That's a word that's in my toolbox. That's become something that helps me problem solve and hope in life. Boom, do it. Boom, stop making excuses. So it's the motivation. If I have to get up, attitude, choice, behavior. 
On the other hand, bad attitude, bad behavior, bad choices. And sometimes I think it's become a matter of perception. Later on, it could be, so what you think of the speaker? My being group said, you stupid. Was the speaker stupid? Or was the speaker, maybe he said something. See, that's what's important. And the speaker, not just me, it could be one of your therapists that is, we're sharing. You either go to therapy with a fixed mindset, well, we got to do this, this is stupid, I'm getting together. Well, you show up with a growth mindset. <clears throat> now, let me end with this. We all arrived. Are you present? Are you engaged? Okay. Now we're getting ready to leave. I know when you leave here, like I've had to leave my hospitals being a patient, I'm given a piece of paper, I've had a conversation, and it became like this. Okay, so what are you going to do now? And they said, okay, listen, maybe in seven days you have to follow up with your doctor or a, a therapist or a psychologist, a psychiatrist, because they might send you off here with maybe a week or two of a game plan, medication, or referral. But you leave here and we go back to where we came from. We are who we associate with. But you're not a victim. And I'll say this, and I want this to make sense. It might not be your fault, whatever it might be. But it doesn't change if it's not down to your responsibility. What does that mean? It's not my fault that I am a man of this with mental illness, but it's my responsibility. What do I do as a result? I'm in therapy. I'm on medication. I ask the questions. And this is a part of my life. And I think today I'm healthier than I've ever been. When I left my wife seven years ago, I'm in the moment where she needed me most. Maybe I had to go through that. And I'm sorry she was on the path of my own. But maybe I had to go through this to learn to become the man that eventually someday I'm going to be really proud of. I'm, I'm proud of me, but I'm still working on me every day. I want you to be working on you. While you're here, we're getting tools. We're going to leave here, and we're going to have some documentation. We're going to know what should be expected. But then it's on you. What, so what are you going to do? Are you going to leave here? Are you going to make a phone call right away? Don't wait to day seven when you have seven days, or day ten when you have to. Do it now. I'm pretty sure every one of you has a phone, probably. You, you have a notepad. You have a, a piece of writing utensil. Write it down. What is your to-do list? Are you looking at it? Or are you waiting for other people to do things? I do it for you. And I'll tell you, when you leave here, the most important thing you can do, make that phone call and show up. Jeff, I, I don't have transportation. That's an excuse. How am I supposed to get there? Walk. Jeff, it's three miles away. So. I met a girl last year. I was in El Paso, Texas. Every day she wakes up at four in the morning, high school senior. She walks seven miles to cross the border to get to school before 7 a.m. to meet with the other student council to make sure she's got her work done, to go to school, she participates in sports, she walks seven miles back home at night. Every day she walks 14 miles. Some days people help and pick her up, but she's walking 7, 14 miles a day because that was important to her to go to school here to get what she needed. Now, yes, you might think differently. 
She has motivation. You all have exactly what she has. When you do the work like I do, you can live a very healthy life. I, I, although I'm a man who loses mental illness, I think I'm healthier than most people. Amen. Amen. But you got to do the work. You got to do the work. I, I want to make this about you. As a man that understands, are there any questions that I can uh, I can ask? Or this because we have this attention, like yes. Thank you for, yeah. The question was, Jeff, do you ever fall? So let me say this. I've been doing this for 28 years. But I think really the past seven, the past six months, I just started sharing the story that I left my wife six months ago. And for a long time, I said, like, what people are going to judge you. I realize that I'm okay you're judging me because I realize that I've done the work, that I'm okay where I am as a result. So I'll, I'll tell you, you want to talk about falling? My medication's out of my bag in my car. Last year, about, me, about last year, I'm home Friday night, and I, I'm getting anxious. And I didn't know where it was from. Saturday, I'm anxious. And I said to my wife, I, I, I just, I need self-care. I need, and, and my wife understands me. And so she's like, okay, do what you got to do. And then Sunday, I'm just, I'm, I'm itchy. I'm, at, I, I'm not understanding why I feel this way. Sunday night, I, I, I don't share this much. I got so angry, I took my Yeti, I'm watching football, and I threw it at the wall. I haven't had an anger explosion like this in years, and I got scared. My comfort place is is I'll go to bed early. My blankets, my pillow, my dog, the darkness, and it just, I just, just want to breathe. And I say to myself, inhale, peace. Exhale. In yoga, they call this a new giant breath, where you inhale through your nose for count of four, you exhale through your nose for count of four. Sometimes it's real hard, I'm just, in that peace, exhale, it will be okay. It will be okay. Breathe. I went into my room that night, my wife came in to try and help. And I'm sorry. But I said everything. You know, it almost becomes like, how many times can you apologize? Before it's like, you know what? It's all you do is apologize, but you don't change. I told her to F off, I said, I hope you die. Get out, shut up. She left. I went to the hospital, I drove myself right to the hospital, I was scared. So I get to the emergency room, the doctor's asking, yes, I understand, I'm in mental health. I, I'm okay, I'm just, I'm, I, I'm, I got this rage inside me. And the doctor's like, okay, so you, who's your doctor, blah, blah, blah. I said, I just, I'm glad I'm here, I'm gonna be okay. So two hours later, the doctor comes back and, and he said to me, blood pressure, everything, he said, listen, I want you to take this when you get home, give me clock and then said, go to sleep. Yes, sir. I go home, I, I take the clot up and I go to bed. I woke up the next morning and I wasn't angry, but I was mad. I was mad because so I was like, why? Because I haven't, this been many years. And I want, when you, when you have the courage to ask the question, the answer appears. And so I was like, I take my medication every day, and every, every Sunday, boom, 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 boom. And, so I decided to go through my medication and I compared, like I cross-referenced, like this, this, okay, this one, this one, this one, this one, vitamin, 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 this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. Where's the, I take Lexa. Um, so now I, I went back to when the last time I said I took my medication, my Lexa broke, and I come and realize it had been some eight days. Immediately I call my doctor, I call my therapist, I have forgotten some, somehow, I don't know. 
I called my wife home and gosh, I'm so thankful my wife invested in this too. I got right back on it. And about three days later, I started feeling better. And I said, so do I ever slip? Yeah, and there are times where I get three hours of sleep. I don't get up early to do my routine. But I'll tell you, before I pull into any audience to speak, in the morning, I stop, I breathe. And, and I'm not a religious person. I think I'm a spiritual person. I stop, I breathe, and I do pray. And is it God, or is it I'm praying to center myself in the responsibility? I have maybe an hour of your life. The responsibility that I feel to, to plant a seed that any of you can later say, well, he made me, he made me feel that it's okay that I'm not okay and I'm growing. If that's what you all want, I couldn't be any more honored to have been here with you today. And so I, I, I pray to center myself, Jeff, be present with these young, impressionable lives. You understand. Give them hope, plant a seed, let them know it's okay to not be okay, but to not be okay and not do something, that's not okay. It's okay to ask for help. And if you judge me, that's your issue, it ain't mine. Everybody has a story. Be proud of yours. Because you know what? What you're going through is shaping you. I would rather you be here at your age growing up these formative years, I think are really important, trying to get to know who we are. When you're 48 years old and you start to figure out who you are, you lose a marriage. Your family becomes affected, your career is affected. Get to know who you are. Be comfortable who you're not. Do the work when you leave here. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, this might be a little much. Not at all. Maybe there's going to be six and seven times. And I'm just, my safe place is here, and I just don't have the courage to live outside of the real world. It's a great question. Sometimes the real world can be scary. So you have a fear. And there might be mental illness, anxiety, depression, Say We have experience. We need to help you come up with tools to build confidence one step at a time. When I was at my worst in my book, boom, four years ago, I had to go through spinal cord fusion, uh, my diabetes, I was given less than a year to live. I remember one day I went to my therapist, Stacy, and I was with her three times a week at this point. And I remember one day we sat down and she said to me, as, as she, the therapist usually sits there, she said, how are you today? What did you do today? And I remember I sat there and I said, let my chicken. She said, you did what? I said, I went and I bought chicken. She applauded me. She applauded me, I bought chicken. I was like, I bought chicken. Well, what's so good about that? She said, what did you do yesterday? I said, nothing. She said, you did more today than you did yesterday. I said, yeah. She says, I'm proud of you. And I was in the Marine Corps, 23 years old. The second time I went to the hospital, my grandmother, Mick, that was her name, Mick, she just passed away this summer, 97 years old, and the family asked me to do the eulogy. When I was, I wanted to die. I called her every day. You know what she would say to me? Just make it to lunch. Just make it to dinner. One day at a time. Breakfast, lunch, dinner. As a man that's, that's trying to answer your question, I think sometimes our expectations that is, is 
bestowed upon us. We have to be or do. Titles. Get a job. Have a family. Go to college. I think that when I did the eulogy for my grandmother, you know what they talked about? Her testimony. Who she was. So is it that I have to go do these epic things, or can I go and be, are you listening? You know that I don't have a dream anymore. I don't have a dream. And I'm okay with that because you know something? You're listening, and I feel that my, my purpose and my passion, this testimony is more important than a dream for me. And so the question is, if you don't want to live, is it that you don't want to live, or do you want to find a reason to live? I think sometimes we've got to find a reason every day. And, and for me, the reason isn't about me. It's become more about what I do. And that my heart, remember the expectation, I'm not walking out of here saying, I fixed everyone! I'm walking out of here, did you listen? Yeah. I have a full heart. To me, that's why I live, because I'm, I found happiness in who I am and what I do. It takes time. I'm still in therapy. I'll take medication forever. I don't ever want you to give up. Don't ever lose hope. Don't make decisions based on emotions. You have something in you that understands many people. I meet people every day that don't want to live. What's that reason to want to live? Let's be bigger than us. Let's find gratitude and appreciation Friends, family, the world we live in. But do you know the grass is green? Do you know how many people don't know that? Because they can't see it. Do you listen to music? Yeah. Do you know how many people can't hear? Because they hear in the band. Look at all the different colors. See, I don't think we appreciate it enough. I think life is a, a quilt. Pieces, shapes, sizes, fabrics, colors, woven together to make one. Now, self-esteem, how do you fit? This world needs you. They need me, they need you, they need We <coughs> I hope I was able to give you something to think about there. Sure. And I appreciate you being honest. Yes, ma'am. Because I don't have to be 
emotionally connected to the world, I could just be present and, and I could take a, a board and, and screw it into this board and holy jeepers, it sticks now. That's cool. Well, those are that 90 degrees. Okay, let's build a few more of them and build a doghouse. I might build an American flag and make it look like glass. I might give it to somebody. I'm, I'm doing cutting boards.
Because you've got to get to that doctor in seven days to, for the medication to continue. And if you do that, your success rate just exponentially soars. Does that answer your question? Thank you so much. Great question. Yes. Yeah, you had another question? No, okay. Yeah. I know I have hurt 
and I told them about my journey and, and that I realized that, that this situation, when this happened, my responsibility, that I asked for your forgiveness, and, and I've gotten forgiveness. Most people have, some people haven't. And I've come to realize that's more their issue than it is mine. And that's okay. But I agree, the hardest person to forgive is yourself. But being aware, you're aware that you have hurt yourself. I think that's okay. What do we need to do? And that's a process. I don't know if there's a timetable for self-forgiveness, but the more you stay in that question, the more tools you get, the more you say, you know what? I made a mistake. You're admitting that there's a mistake you made. That is powerful. You can't take it back. You can change as you move forward. It might not be your fault, it might be your fault, but it's always your responsibility and today versus then. I'm not today who I was then, and I don't want you to judge me for that. If you do, I think it's kind of shallow thinking that you're judging me for who I was eight years ago. For eight years, I'm doing the work. I'm a better man. If you're gonna judge me, that's okay. I'm not going to allow that to affect me. I want you to spend every day in your heart. And if you have to stand in the mirror and say, it's okay. I am a good person. I'm going to strive every day to be a good person. I'm going to be unconditional and supportive, non-judgmental. I'm going to love. I'm going to serve. I'm awesome. If you have to stand in the mirror, affirmations, write that down, say it every day, that's what you do. If you're in counseling once a week, once a month, every day, from what you may have been through, that's awesome. Do the work. But it starts with you and your own heart, I think. The fact that you even ask the question is amazing. I'm 48 and I'm asking you. How old are you? 16 is a tough age. At 16, you're the age I was, October, it was October 15, 18, 20th. At this time, 16 years old, is when I sat there with my dad's gun and he came down. That was my first hospital experience. Yes? Your mom was devastated when you tried to make a forever decision. Plan together, you work hard, 
But you know something? You might not be a pro basketball player. But your journey and your working hard and your passion, you might end up being a coach. And that's okay. I, my dream is to be a male bikini model. <laughs> but I might not, I might be a photographer. You know, follow that dream, you never know where it goes. I don't want to be a bikini model. Pass that. <laughs> yeah. I've learned to love it. Like people ask me all the time, how, how, how do you talk to kids that are hurting? Doesn't it break your heart? I love to empathize with because I understand, but I can't carry the pain. I can't carry the pain. I have enough pain, but I'm working on my pain. And I, I kind of hope that in how I'm becoming healthy and more healthy in therapy and medication, I like that I can take some of these tools and share with you and, and give hope, but I do it every year. I've been pretty angry the past 24 hours. I want to tell you why. There's a pastor and a mental health advocate out in California who I guess is pretty popular who made the forever decision to suicide in 36 hours. And then yesterday I heard about the, the director of psychology and counseling for Portland now at the University of Pennsylvania in the past six months, he just ended his life, I think, on Monday morning. And I'm angry, and I'm, I want to tell you why I'm angry. I feel, and I might not be right, I'm, I'm still working on this, and I probably should be talking about it. I'm angry because I feel that when you are talking about mental health and, and empathizing, and you're doing the work, I feel that if they should have been in this position, that they should have been doing the work every day. And then when it got to that point, that they knew enough to just go to someone and say, I'm not okay and I just need to be with someone. And I wish they had taken the time out, no matter if you've been here four or five times, go six, seven times, go eight, nine times. I think that if you keep working and developing the tools and asking the questions, I'm just angry that they've been advocating, they made a decision, and the decision they made, I can sense a bigger message that you can lose hope. God doesn't answer all depression. That he, I just, it, it, my heart hurts because I don't think suicide is the answer. I, I don't want you to lose hope. I think we grow from our thoughts and our feelings. So I think I love it because it's in my heart. I don't have a dream. Did you listen? Did you listen? I'm a fat ball guy. I still get to share my heart in a way young people want to listen. It's this, this, I think when I was younger, it was about me. But the more I live and learn and grow, the more I realize this isn't about me. I got to spend a whole week in this community. I got to spend time with Dennis. I got to meet teachers and the students, fun, the administrative teachers. I had one of the best weeks of my life. People accepted me. They even accepted me, and I talked about suicide and mental health. Most people are like, oh, he's in therapy. He's not. He, that's why I work for him. That's their issue. We talk about it all day. Because it, I think it's okay. It's okay. Listen, I don't think like everybody thinks. I don't do like everybody does. I don't act or speak like everybody else. I'm becoming okay with me. And I want you to be okay with you. But remember the person I asked who's the hardest person to get to know. Spend more time getting to know you. And be okay with that. And it's going to take teachers and therapists. I think everybody should be on medication. I think everybody should be in therapy. Now I'm saying medication prescribed by probably a mental health professional, not self-medicating. I met someone this week who 
told me that he takes vitamins. Well, oh, let's go vitamins, that's great, good. No, vitamins are medication. Well, my mom says they're vitamins. By a doctor? No, my mom went on the internet and, and bought these vitamins, and so my mom says they're vitamins. I mean, what does it look like? Uh, it's like a little blue pill. I mean, what is it? Uh, uh, no. I ain't never met a kid in all my years that can tell me what medication you're taking. That right away has to be the first responsibility to know what you're taking. Well, I'm taking Lexapro, I'm taking Infection, I'm taking Benadryl, I'm taking Zyrtec, I'm taking Niagara, I'm taking... <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> Again, I'm not the most appropriate speaker. <laughs> That's funny. For young people to not be able to tell me they're not doing the work, don't rely on your parents and say, well, I'll make sure you take your medication. Okay, okay. What the hell are you taking? No, what are you taking? Why are you taking it? What does it do? So, yeah. Okay, say that a little bit. What if your parents don't allow you to? That's a good question. What if your parents don't allow you to know what the medication is until you get better? I don't. I don't know your parents. I think that's more of. A, I want to hope that's more of a perception. Whereas, if you were my daughter and you were showing me that you had an interest in. Well, why am I taking this? Like, Mom, Dad, what is this medication supposed to do? Like, how is it supposed to help me feel? My doctor therapist says this, so are there side effects? What, what is the benefit of me taking this every day? And if you were showing an interest, I would think that they'd want to sit down and explain to you what medication does and how it helps the, the chemical balance or the neurotransmitters that are going through. It's kind of like eating better food. Some people are allergic to dairy or something. So we change our diet. I think it's very similar to that. I was saying earlier, self-medicating. If you're in therapy and take medication by a mental health professional, but you're self-medicating with alcohol, vaping, um, marijuana, smoking pot, it, you've totally, taking away the benefit of why you're taking medication. And then it's, it's the game shift, there's nothing you can do. And I think a lot of it goes back to our coping skills. Make sure we're coping in a healthy way. And just because other people are doing it, you don't have to do it. Good question. Couple more, anything? Yeah. Um, No, but self-harm is also reckless behavior. Self-harm is uh, self-medicating. I'm struggling with this. I, I've never cut, I've never um, reckless behavior, I've never done a drug or cigarette. I, I, I'm not a drinker, but every once in a while, like almost every day when I'm speaking, I do like a monster energy drink. And I think I'm going to take my, my doctor counselor's advice. Is it healthy every day? Well, I don't do it every day. I think in moderation, does it, here's the thing that I'm thinking that my doctor will tell me. Risk first reward. You know, because sometimes I'm just, I'm exhausted and I need, do you give it your coffee? Yeah, so I'm kind of thinking my monster is like my coffee. And I, I take Vyvanses, I take Lexapro, but for a long time the Lexapro had me just feeling... I don't want to go. And so I had to ask the question. And I talked to my doctor, and so we, we talked about Vyvanses. But then we read about it, my doctor was very apprehensive to give me Vyvanses, because manic, she was afraid that I would have this, this uh, it would accelerate the bipolar. And so I said to my doctor, to my doctor, trust me, knows that I probably know more than she knows, and she says, 
Jeff, I'm gonna leave it up to you. And I said, let's try it. Because she knows I also have a journal, how I feel, what am I feeling. So if I'm taking it and I'm not feeling right, I'm in a journal, I call her right away. And so ever since we tried the journal, I see, and I gotta see her every three months to get, and so one of my questions about six months ago, I've been on it for a couple of years now, I guess, uh, I said to her, uh, Catherine, I mean, what's the, the adverse effect of me taking Vyvanse long term? She said to me, she says, Jeff, risk first reward. Is it helping? Yeah. Let's not worry about it. Okay. I think that's really my only question to solve. Yeah. Self harm. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Keep going. And self harm. What is your experience with it? Yeah. What is your choice of self harm? Yeah. Let me tell you something. I like kids think I'm crazy. Because when our parents find out that our kids are for self harm and cutting, they explode, they overreact. And so when I say to you, uh, do you think self harm is wrong? And typically we're like, no, it's not right. I say, I don't think it's wrong. I think, oh, well, you're, you're kind of a different therapist. Let me tell you what I mean. I think self harm cutting, when you can recognize why you're doing it, I'm getting out of my head. I'm, I'm taking control emotionally, physically. I am in control of the pain. I want this to send a trigger. You're aware that you're coping, not in a healthy way. So to have the courage to what can I do to cope in a more healthy way? Because the next question is this. I'm alone, I'm a disappointment, I guess that's a part of your past. Third is usually the self-harm, okay? Red flag, red flag, red flag. I am thinking, I'm gonna be patient with you. I'm gonna get you to want to ask for help. My next question is this, don't answer it. I say, do you want to die? And most people say, I don't know. Some people say sometimes, yes, no. Then we go further on that. And then I'm going to come back to the self harm. And I say, do you know why? Most people don't want to die because they can't imagine going through the pain or hurting someone else. That is a double red flag. Because I want you, if you will die for someone, I want you to choose to want to live for someone. Most importantly, you. But when we cut, here's what happens. The pain becomes more tolerable. And if we're not asking for help and coping in the right way, I need help, I need to talk to someone. It gets more tolerable, you keep going. When you break skin, blood appears. Have you ever had that? Two things that happen. The blood is like the endorphins that a butter that's running. Number one, and that, you feel empowered by that. Or number two, the scars, the blood, now it's like I'm ashamed, I can't tell anybody. What if they find out? They're gonna be disappointed, more disappointed. And the deeper you go and the further you go, and you're not asking your help, you're coping by yourself, and you're already not thinking clearly, then all of a sudden you get to a point where I'm afraid you start justifying that maybe the world will be so I like it in that it sends a signal that you are coping, but I also wanted to send that signal that I need to cope in a more healthy way. I need, this is bigger than, I need to talk to someone. Does that make sense? And I want people to know that it is okay to talk. Because I see kids every day, and I see kids every day with scars that nobody else knows. Yeah. I'm 48 years old. You think it happened overnight? 
I'm still coughing. I wake up every morning and I breathe. I bring down my anxiety. I wake up every morning and I just say to myself, ah, I'm in a state today. So I turn maybe not having that state to talk to some young people. I get to share my heart. I feel I get to do this. I'm going to make it an awesome day. I'm going to be awesome. So my coping skills are just, I, I, I've been doing the work. I'm finding a love and appreciation. I don't think you ever fully develop coping skills that are in your toolbox that you always pull out of your pocket. I think we're always learning. Don't ever stop wanting to learn new ways of coping. I mean, someone might say something to you, and when you're young, you're like, well, that's you! And now you might look at me, I have tattoos, and I'll be like, so I don't react anymore. That's, but I'm, work, I, I'm working on this every day. Having this opportunity of being with you and planting seeds, this, this isn't only I'm walking away to make I plant the seeds, I'm walking away just grateful that I got to be the vehicle that got to do this. Don't ever stop. Your journey doesn't stop when you leave here. You just given the time out here. But now, what are you going to do with me? That's all on you. But I think one of the biggest things when you walk away from here, and this is in your rear view mirror, do not be ashamed. Part of the stigma is being ashamed. Don't be ashamed. All right, two more. Two more. Yes, thank you. Uh, when I have fallen, who's there to help me out? I think now I, 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 wow. I think my wife now. So when I was 16 years old and I came to the hospital, I don't really remember this time. I, this is before or after. I was, I was going to an old boy Catholic school. I remember it was like 11 o'clock at night. I don't know how. Did they make the phone call? Did they reach out to me? I don't remember. One of the brothers, Brother Al, he has since passed. I remember one night I was at the brother's residence and he invited me in. And we were sitting in the room. And there were two beds. I remember I was sitting on one bed and he was sitting on the other bed across from me in his black robe. And I remember he just sat there. And I remember distinctly the only thing he said was, So why is that significant? Yeah, but he was just there to want to listen. And I think I went through so much of my life pushing away the messengers. My mom is, is one of my I've got three women in my life, my wife hates that I say this. I've got three women in my life that have meant the world to me. My mom, my aunt, and my grandmother, Mickey. And I think they were always there too in their way that they know how. But I think it was there to pick me up. I think I had to find a way. And now I, my wife, I've got friends, my, my therapist. I don't talk at home. Um, people don't even really know what I do. I don't want to get into it. And then the thing is, people think you have the answers, and I, I don't. So I'm pretty quiet. Um, but I'm on my own journey, um, picking myself up. That's a powerful question. And how old are you? I'm sorry? I'm 48. You're 16, you have the ability to ask that question. What's your answer? Um, 
I'm sorry? Sometimes they're there, but we don't see them. Where do you live? York. I know you are. I know there's a lot of people in York. Where do you go to school? I know you are. You got some teachers, counselors, therapists. No, you do, you might not see it. I want you to open your heart. You've got plenty of people that want to help you in the journey. But ultimately, I'll tell you what, you have to do the work. I'm proud of you, you get it. I'm proud of you, I'm just so proud you asked that question. Last one, anyone? Right. Folks, my social media, Jeff Dolphin, my name, I, they put stuff out every day, if I can help you, you get out, wherever you are. Get out to the work. Be responsible. This journey doesn't stop. I'm, I'm on it every day. I want you to be on it every day. Do the work. Be proud. Get to know you. Find the tools. I so appreciate that I was allowed to be part of your life. Do the work, my friends. Thank you so much for listening. All right.